Well, good evening, everybody. Um, my name's Simon Edwards, Councillor Simon Edwards. I'm chair of the Moulins and Coombe uh, Neighbourhood Committee, and that's what we're here to do tonight. So welcome, everybody, who's here tonight. Uh, we're not being live-streamed, uh, but we are being webcammed, and so there may be some people hereafter who will look at this when it's on the uh, RBK uh, website, I think, I imagine, tomorrow. Anyway, that's the meeting tonight. Um, so far as COVID is concerned, um, we, we've been maintained um, ventilation, there are a uh, hand gel around, um, masks are optional, I actually forgot mine. Um, but anyway, as I'm speaking, I would be wearing a mask because otherwise my voice would be rather muffled. Um, emergency, if the alarm sounds, uh, it is actually an emergency. Uh, rather than in practice, uh, and so please leave by the main staircase, congregate at the front of the building. Anyone who requires assistance, please remain in your seats, and an officer will assist you from the bil building. I've already mentioned the fact that we're being uh, live, live broadcast. Um, that will cease if um, we have to adjourn the meeting into a private session to consider exempt business. Um, can you all please put your mobile phones either off or on silent during the me meeting? Um, um, not, not that uh, uh, it, it's a, a, a huge crime if they go off. Um, it, it, it's always amusing when, when it's the chair or, or w in my line of work, it's the judge whose phone goes off, um, but let's hope nobody's phone goes off. Now, um, I'd just like to introduce everybody uh, who's sitting around the table, or the members first. Um, you, you know who I am. I've got beside me on my right, Councillor Leslie Heap, who is my vice chair. She is uh, a councillor for Beverly Wall. To her right is Councillor Mark Durrant, who again is a councillor for Beverly L Wall. And then Councillor Tim Bailey, Coon Vale, Councillor Tim Cobbett with me in St. James, Councillor Annette Wookie with me in St. James. Uh, and then uh, next to the uh, uh, police sergeant from whom you'll be hearing in a moment, uh, Councillor Jason Hughes from Old Malden, uh, Councillor Ed Bram from uh, up on Coombe Hill, uh, Councillor Shepherd, uh, Nicola Shepherd, uh, again from Old Malden. I have various officers assisting me. Uh, to my left, from Democratic Services, uh, who basically run everything, it's uh, Fiona Potter. Uh, to her left is our uh, neighbourhood manager, uh, Megan Mellon, and you, uh, you will be hearing later from other officers, and I'll introduce those as we come along. So that, that, that's really who's who. Um, now, uh, before we commence the business of this meeting, uh, I want to um, mention uh, former councillor David Fraser. Uh, he sadly passed away earlier this year. Uh, he uh, was a former councillor and indeed an honorary alderman. What that means is once you've done at least 12 years, and he did many more on the council, uh, and you don't want to sit again as a councillor, you can be made an honorary alderman. Uh, and he was one of those, and it, it's an honour to be at such, and uh, he thoroughly deserved it, because he served as a councillor uh, between 1984 and 2018. So <laughs> rather put, puts everybody else around this table in, in, in their place, I think. Um, uh, and uh, it was first in St. James, the ward which I currently represent, and then uh, down in Old Malden. Um, he uh, was deputy mayor on three, no fewer than three occasions, 1989 to 1990, 1990 to 91, and 1998 to 1999. He was awarded the MBE in 2013 for services to health and the community of the Royal Borough. And as I said, in October 2018, when he finally decided to hang up his robes, metaphorically, um, he uh, was installed uh, as an honorary alderman. Um, I'm sure the committee and indeed everyone present would want to uh, both um, belatedly and posthumously thank him for his excellent service and send their condolences to his family and friends. Um, if anybody else wants to say anything about uh, David Fraser, I didn't know him personally. I, I've been, been able to 
the age of it with his son, who actually lives in my ward about various issues, but I never met him. Apart from, I, I did see him at commissions, but I, I never met him. If there's anybody else who wants to say a few words, then that's fine. Otherwise, um, I think we uh, will sadly miss the passing of someone who served the Royal Borough for, for so long in such an excellent way. Thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda is public questions. Um, now, I think it's right to say, Fiona, that we don't have any um, as such, although there are going to be... Oh, we, we do. Yeah, we can ask one question. One question. <laughs> Excellent. Um, that, that, that's very good. Um, I, um, yeah, that... Uh, if you can... Uh, is the mic actually switched on? The mic is switched on, yeah. so you don't need to switch it on. Okay. Can people hear me? Thank I you. think we can. If you could introduce yourself so and then ask, ask your question. If it's something we can deal with now, we will. Uh, it, it, that rather depends what the question is, because a, a, as they say on Would I Lie to You, um, I don't know what, what no, the question is. No, um, and uh, um, so uh, I, I, if we can deal with it now, we will. Yep. Um, but it may be that we can't, in which case you'll get a written answer. It may be it will be a hybrid and you'll get something now and something later. So over to you. Thank you very much. Julian McCarthy, Blagdon Road. I live opposite the Malden Centre. I've been a resident of New Malden for 47 years. Um, some of you know me. My heart is totally for New Malden and Kingston. Okay, good evening. It's actually a rhetorical question, so once I've said what I will say, it really leaves it with you and I don't need an answer. But good evening. Is the New Morden Neighbourhood Committee aware that there is significant and growing public concern in New Morden that the council executive and officers may be operating and pushing for demolition of the Morden Centre on potentially outdated, inaccurate and flawed information, which might result in the needless additional expenditure. And that as councillors and committee members representing the neighbourhood, they have both the right and an implied duty to challenge the council officers on the veracity and accuracy of such information in order to avoid needless expenditure and consequential damage to the environment. And if they are so aware, please could they challenge if they consider appropriate? And if they are not so aware, please could they check their remit as neighbourhood committee members and councillors and not let potentially flawed, inaccurate information affect the officers' decisions and directives, bearing in mind that there is a corporate and resources committee meeting next Thursday when this will be voted on. I don't specifically require an answer, but trust that the rhetoric I've just provided is understood by you all. Thank you. Thank you. In, in fact, I did have advanced notice of that question, um, which I thought you were going to... Uh, I will put be coming up uh, on the, the next later, section. but... Yeah, uh, yeah. I'll um, wait for that yeah, next section, I'm but I want to get that openly. Um, absolutely fine. Um, Thank you. Uh, just just uh, so you know, um, a number of members of this committee, some of whom aren't able to be here tonight, also sit on corporate and resources. Thank you. Um, I think Councillor Durrant does, um, Councillor Cobbett does, um, a few, uh, uh, I know Councillor George does and Councillor Davis and Councillor Bass, not, not, they, they aren't able to be here tonight, um, but they will have seen your question. Thank you. Because you sent it to everybody. I have sent it to everybody. And... and I apologise for doing so, but... No, uh, uh, Julian, the, the, if I may call you Julian. You can. You um, can. The, there is absolutely no need to apologise. Um, your, your question asks a, a, a very pertinent series of questions, I suppose. It's not just one question, it's several. What I would say, and this, this is not meant to be a comprehensive answer, is this, that the, the, the decision on the issues that you raise is not made by this committee, obviously. It is made, as you know, and have indicated by the Corporate and Resources Committee, which will sit in a week's time. Um, you may have looked already at the report which will be going to that committee, and you will understand, of course, that there are numerous annexes to that report, 
which are not in the public domain. Um, that is, as you, you will be aware, because of their commercial confidentiality. Now, I've read those reports, uh, and um, I'm sure that those who uh, will be going to the Cor Corporate and Resources Committee um, on next Thursday either have read them or will have read them. I, I will be there, but as a spectator, uh, not as a member of that committee. Uh, what I would say about those reports, um, I'm, I, it's, I, I, you won't be able to read them, I'm afraid, uh, but what I would say is about those reports is that they are extremely detailed and they are from uh, professionals who are um, very well thought of in their field. Now, that may or may not be an answer that gives you any comfort, but it, it, it is, if you like, something of an explanation, uh, particularly um, as there are those in this room have listened to your question and might feel that some form of explanation, e uh, even as brief as that, is required. Thank you. Um, when it comes up onto the agenda, I and you ask if there's anybody who's got a comment, I would like to take the opportunity. Uh, you, uh, you, I will call you up at that point. I hadn't realised you were going to split no, your time. No, but thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Brush you up. Thank you very much, Julian. Any other questions, are there? Fiona, do you know any other? Okay, uh, excellent. Well, uh, moving to uh, item two on the agenda, apologies. Um, Fiona, can you let us know of apologies? I, I know of five. <laughs> yes, thank you, Chair. I have apologies from councillors Roy Aurora, Marina Bass, Kevin Davis, Jason Ha, uh, Munir Ravalia, uh, I think, and that's it. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, I hadn't had one from Councillor Jord either. Um, declarations of interest. Um, members are now have the opportunity to declare any disclosable pecuniary or non-pecuniary interests in uh, relevant to any item on the agenda. So, do any members have any such interests they wish to declare? No. Um, petitions. I think we've got a petition. Um, Angus, do you want to come forward with your petition? I th there's just the one, is it? Well, I can't get it to you on this. Okay. I, I, you're, are you pre presenting two petitions tonight, one from each road, or is it just one petition? It's the... Hi there, hi there. Angus Anderson, Welbeck Post. As I understood, just the one petition for both Excellent. Roads. Well, um, if you'd like um, just to say who you are, what the petition says, and if you like, just say one or two words about it. Sure. Hi there. Um, Angus Anderson um, from Welbeck Close. Um, the petition is about Welbeck Close and St. James's Close, um, and the amount of through traffic coming through the closes, using it as a turning area, even though it's signposted uh, as access only. Um, we feel that this is partly due to the no left turn on Bodley Road, um, further up near the A3, and the signage in both these closes actually should be uh, enforced so that people coming and turning in, in and going straight out again actually um, are dissuaded from doing that. Um, I believe that is possible by various camera systems that the council has and that can then be implemented in the front of these closes. Um, we feel quite strongly in the closes about this because there's a number of young families in the closes and lots of kids play on their bikes in the road, in the close, and it's becoming more and more dangerous. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Angus. I, we have an officer from Highways, uh, Sunny Fam. I don't know if you have any, I, I know this petition has, has already been sent to Highways. This is its formal presentation. I don't know, Sonny, if you have anything which you wish to say immediately about it. Yeah, yes, Chair. I have a, um, a, a note from Ian Price, the usual officer for the neighbourhood engineer. Basically, what he's saying is the team uh, investigating the issue raised and will be in contact with the police petitioner 
once the investigation has been completed and we'll bring the report back to this field uh, meeting of this committee. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. And others, a, a formal recognition that it received, understood, and will be looked into. It's something which I know, uh, Angus, you and I have been looking at um, for quite a few years now. And so uh, no doubt we'll be pressing for that response uh, quickly and uh, in, in full. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the next item is a presentation from Sergeant Oliver Bisgrove, who is one of our, uh, he's from the Northeast Kingston Ward Cluster Safer Neighbourhood Team. Uh, and he's going to tell us a little bit uh, about his work, the work of the Safer Neighbourhood Teams, with, all, with whom we all have uh, regular contact. And um, so, uh, Sergeant Bisgrove, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor. Uh, I thought I'd use the time to, I guess, introduce myself, introduce uh, my team, the resources, um, talk a little bit about the priorities that my team look after, uh, give a couple of updates from uh, a couple of my colleagues as well who aren't here today. And, um, and we go from there. So uh, a brief introduction. It's quite a mouthful, isn't it? Uh, Safer Neighbourhood Sergeant of North East Kingston Ward Cluster. What that really means is I look after a team that look after the Beverly Ward, um, Coombe Vale, and also Norberton as well. Um, in terms of the makeup of the team, I have seven dedicated ward officers, and they're split across those uh, three wards. And I have uh, two PCSOs as well. Um, in terms of uh, resourcing, um, I'm happy to announce that at the moment I'm uh, fully resourced, which has been uh, a real challenge within the Safer Neighbourhood team. Um, and there's still a bit of sort of embedding and uh, I guess learning for a, a couple of officers which have come on as well. In terms of the priorities, which um, my cluster specializes in uh, that, that we look after. Uh, the first one is violence with injury, and typically that's drug related. In terms of the cluster, um, as I've mentioned, we've got Norberton. For those who are unfamiliar with war territories, uh, the, Cambridge Road, uh, the Cambridge Road estate is within uh, the Norberton ward. What that does is it has a knock on effect with the other wards as well, so be it Beverly, um, Coombe Vale, and further out as well. So what I typically do is pull my resources, so the, the seven DWOs, and we focus on that as a priority, so looking at any drug-related uh, crime. Uh, the second priority is antisocial behavior. Um, in terms of Beverly and Coombe Vale, Blackton Road car park for those who know of the uh, know of the area. Um, I'm sure you're very aware of uh, the issues which happen around the car park and and the open spaces. Um, my team use a, a variety of tactics to um, uh, to try and tackle anything drug related, but also working with uh, other agencies as well in regards to sort of safeguarding and that sort of things. So it's an ongoing issue and uh, it's something which I think it will continue for some time. Um, in terms of Coombe Vale, it's typically around the, the Dickeridge Park area. Um, for those who aren't familiar of the area, it's a, a large open space and typically you would see um, sort of low level sort of um, be it smoking cannabis or uh, drinking, littering, that, that side of things as well. Uh, the third priority is uh, burglary as well. Um, in terms of burglary, I've, I've got a couple of statistics um, which I thought I'd share with you and, and talk through some recent sort of strategy which we're looking to implement as well. So in terms of Beverly, uh, from January to February, looking at 12 burglaries in total, which, to give you an idea, were actually lower than we were last year, which is positive. Um, Coombe Vale, we've had one burglary, 
within um, uh, within the, the two month period as well. Obviously I can't comment on March. So there's something which is going well there. Um, in terms of ongoing strategy, from a reactive point of view, we're starting what's called super cocooning, which uh, effectively means when a burglary happens, we of course visit every victim, but we also visit five neighbors on each side, 10 neighbors opposite, and five neighbors on the other side as well. And that's to give crime prevention advice, that's to let neighbors know that there's a burglary which has happened, and also to aid our investigation as well. Um, in regards to the burglaries in the last couple of months, the typical trend has been um, be it sheds which haven't been locked, for instance, um, and unsecured premises, so be it back doors and, and that side of things. In addition to the three priorities, um, a really hot topic and, and something which is, which is close to to my team is, is VORG. What that acronym means is Violence Against Women and Girls. Uh, what my team's been doing is um, in December, we were raising uh, local businesses' awareness of the Ask Angela um, procedure, which effectively means if, um, if there's been a social engagement which has happened in a, um, in a pub or something like that, which isn't going well, then... Um, that individual can go to the bar and ask for Angela, which will activate a number of protocols. So my team have been educating and also um, testing those processes as well within the local pubs, and that's been something which has been going across uh, Kingston as a whole, um, which, has been, which has been really successful. Um, in addition to that, uh, there was a, a tool which was released last year um, called Street Safe, which is a website that anybody can go on and they can register where they don't feel comfortable uh, within their local community. So if there's a place which is uh, poorly lit, for instance, or they just don't feel comfortable within that area, that's flagged to us. That's also flagged to uh, the council as well. And it goes some way in working towards making people feel a little bit more comfortable. So what my team does with that data is we turn it, we, we use um, hotspots, for instance. So any high visibility patrols, we will target those hotspots where people don't feel comfortable. And then what we will do after that is we will go back and survey that area to see how effective um, those patrols are. It's new in design, it's new in concept. Um, and I think in terms of the work that the Met, my team, and the neighbourhood team need to do uh, for Vorg. It's um, it, it goes some way, but there's certainly uh, a lot more that we can um, that we can look at. Um, a couple of anecdotal good news stories from my team. Um, be it violence as one of the priorities. Uh, there was uh, an, an unfortunate incident last uh, last week. I'm not sure if you're aware of it, where there was a, a stabbing outside of a nightclub um, in the high street. My team, after positively identifying one of the uh, one of the suspects, the day after arrested him, um, and that was again linked to the Cambridge Road estate. It's an ongoing investigation, so I can't go into any more details. But anecdotally, um, very proud of my very small team um, in, uh, in assisting with that investigation. Um, there was a, a, a murder in uh, Surbiton as well last year, which I'm sure you're all aware of. My team were also um, uh, responsible for, for catching that murder as well, which, um, which is pretty amazing. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm representing two of my other colleagues who aren't here today, so Graham Chapman and also Steve Hales as well, and they've passed on um, a couple of updates in terms of their areas and their priorities. So Steve Hales, who's the sergeant for Coombe Hill, they've had um, a number of 
weeks of action, we call it, around burglaries, which is mass leaflet dropping and super cocooning as well. Um, catalytic converter week of action, um, which has been a bit raising awareness. What we're doing as, a, as an overall safer neighbourhood team is we're upskilling and we're training about catalytic, catalytic converter marking, so i.e. individually marking each catalytic converter and also um, providing locks as well to uh, vehicles which, um, which are targeted. Um, that training's ongoing over, over March, so hopefully we'll be implementing our officers utilising that skill in, um, in the coming months, which is pretty exciting. Um, further to Steve's update he's put here, so in terms of Kingston University, there's been repeated burglaries on campus by youths breaking in and taking food items, of all things. Um, they've been liaising directly with the head of security, uh, identifying areas uh, for development within securing campus buildings. Uh, Kingston Hospital, uh, many thefts are occurring within the wards of staff property, which is disgusting. Um, and there's a planned operation to also highlight the importance of securing, uh, securing property as well there. Uh, Graham Chapman's provided me with an update in regards to Old Morden. His priorities are uh, burglary. In February, there were six burglaries. Theft of motor vehicle. Uh, there were six in February, um, high-value high value keyless ignition cars taken overnight using electronic relays, apparently. Um, and theft from motor vehicle, there's three in February, um, which catalytic converters. Oh, sorry, no, catalytic converters have dropped off a little bit. Um, and antisocial behaviour around the hogs. Uh, the hogs mill is one of his priorities. However, it's been quiet over the last month. Uh, there's been work around the patrolling and prevention with the team being trained, as I mentioned, uh, in catalytic converter, um, marking and installing locks on them. Um, and he's also made a comment on here that one of the PCSOs within the area is going to be off for six weeks because he's injured. St. James, uh, James's priorities are burglary, there was four in February, theft from motor vehicle, three in February, and ASB is around Manor Park, um, where apparently drugs were taken off five people in the car park. There's been a charge, a PND, a caution, and two comrades, which all sounds pretty good. Uh, again, that team has been trained in catalytic converter marking as well. Uh, he's also um, mentioned here that there's been significant progress made in relation to building a uh, Korean community through uh, a local Saturday school, which uh, reminds me I'm working very closely with a senior uh, chief superintendent, Choi, um, who works for uh, the Korean embassy. And um, we're working together to see how we can um, serve the Korean uh, community um, a little bit better, um, and that's ongoing as well. So pretty exciting. But that's um, that's my update, Councillor. Um, thank you very much. Um, before I throw open the floor to questions, which I will do in a moment, um, I'd just like to add. I think Meg, you were going to say this. I'm going to steal your thunder here. Um, Friday week, tomorrow week, uh, St James Church Hall. At seven o'clock, the St. James Safer Neighbourhood team is running a crime prevention evening. Uh, every, uh, it starts at seven, goes on till half past eight. So everybody is welcome to come along, tell your neighbours, uh, and um, hopefully that will be a, an opportunity for people to come along, uh, ask questions, and hear latest hints and tips about how to avoid being the victim of crime. Um, so. Th Thanks very much for that. I have one question which I'll, I will ask later. Um, but um, start with members of the public. Do any members of the public wish to come forward and ask Sergeant Bisgrove uh, a, a question about what he said or, or more generally? Um, members of the committee. Uh, Councillor Durrett. Thank you, Chair. 
Um, it was a surprise that in uh, Beverly Ward we, we have experienced a couple of uh, racially motivated crimes, uh, which is, is, is very distressing. Uh, and I wanted to thank um, uh, PC Wayne Griffiths for, for very swiftly dealing with the uh, uh, incident around the throwing of paint at the, uh, uh, the Tamil event in January, which was, which was awful. Uh, and and thanks to, a swift, uh, to your team's swift action, it it didn't really spoil the day. So um, so I, I just want to say uh, a note of thanks there as well. Um, and also we we, we had the um, very unfortunate uh, incident around the the, the barbers at uh, uh, next to the waitress, which was I have to say I was extremely shocked to uh, to see this happening in 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 my ward where you know normally. Uh, everybody rubs along very well with each other, um, and I just wanted to sort of get an update as to, you know, um, how that's going. Have you managed to find uh, the person responsible, um, and and what can we do? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor. I'm I'm glad you brought that up. Actually, um, so yes, we have identified who it is. Um, there's a lot of work which is going on at the moment from the two DWOs in regards to a long-term solution for this individual. Um, I totally agree. I think it's one of the, the most shocking things that we've seen on the cluster in a very long time, and I know it hit the community really hard. Um, from, I guess, um, a confidence-building point of view, we've, we are regularly visiting the barber and, and also the, the coffee shop as well, and we will continue to do that. Uh, my team are specifically tasked to that area. Every time they're on patrol, they will hit that area as well to offer that, um, that level of reassurance. The individual, which I obviously can't go into to much detail at the moment, um, he is known to us. Um, it's a bit of a long process in regards to collecting the right evidence to make sure that he doesn't pester the community again, basically. I, without going around the houses, that's, that's sort of all I can really dive into at the moment. Um, perhaps maybe at the next meeting, I'll be able to specifically say what's happened from there. But we are looking at longer term solutions as opposed to um, just the evidence which is involved with that situation, but something um, more along the lines of... Um, uh, restricting access and um, giving us a, a few more powers in terms of what we can do if he's in a certain location, for instance. It, hopefully that answers your question. Councillor Cobbett. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Chair, and uh, thank you to Sergeant Bisbrough for the presentation. You don't quite cover my area, but I know Graham and uh, Lisa do a great job in, in St. James area and work closely with us. There was a couple of different things I was going to ask. Is, um, one is a slightly technical geek, geeky question, which you may or may not know the answer, but uh, so it's fine if you don't. But I'm aware that, in fact, it's on our agenda that we're, as the council, our, our wards are changing mm, um, yes. at the, uh, from going from 16 to 19 wards. And I know currently your setup is based on you kind of mirror our setup, which works quite well because you have that liaison between the councillors and the, yes. particularly the community support officers. So just whether you know of whether there's anything happening around that, or whether you'll be mirroring our structure in the future, or if, if that's known. Um, on the work again, uh, around violence against women and girls, uh, say th thank you for all the team are doing because that's obviously a really important area. And um, it, it, again, you may not have the information at your fingertips, but it would be great to know, particularly around our town centre locations, how we're doing with getting staff, particularly in some of our night venues, trained up to be aware of the scheme so that if somebody's in that situation, they've, they've got more places to go. Um, and I suppose my last area was around... Um, obviously, we all spend a lot of time speaking to residents, and people always say, you know, they sort of want to see the police walking about as a kind of reassurance. And obviously that's difficult because you're, like all public services, you've got limited resource, you're torn between going to where you know there's an incident where the need is and sort of general reassurance. But 
what we've started to see more of is, uh, certainly in our area, and I'm sure in other areas as well, is your team's working really closely with some of our community groups and organisations. So sort of building those relationships and kind of building that soft intelligence and community policing. So I know it's something we're already doing, but if we could see even more of that in the future as part of your work, that would, that would be great. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. Um, so to answer your questions, in, in regards to uh, the structure, I don't know. It's something which I can come back to you on uh, at a later date. I, I, know there's, I know there's work in the process of exactly how it's going to work. And I know that, for instance, uh, the Beverly Ward is going through a name change and things like that as well. I don't know if we're going to be mirroring that and, and how exactly that works. Um, so leave that with me, if that's OK. Um, in regards to Vaughan in the town centres, it, I just wanted to clarify, when you say the town centre, do you mean Kingston Town Centre or, or do you mean in regards to your ward town centre? The, the so, I mean, interesting you should say that. Some of the statistics which came through from StreetSafe, um, some, of those, um, uh, so some of those points within the heat map were concentrating around the town centre where people feel uneasy. Now, that could be down to the amount of people who were surveyed, for instance, or the amount of people that actually used the town centre but the reality is we need to, to have a look at that statistic overall. Um, the Kingston Town Centre, uh, in regards to award, has gone through a massive restructure. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but where there used to be um, what we would previously call a, a super ward, where there was um, more DWOs, there is now a town centre team. That town centre team is designed to look at the nighttime economy, which is going really well. Um, there's plenty of success stories which is going from that. And moving forward as well, I know that Vorg is such a hot topic for them, and it will continue to be so as well. Um, in regards to uh, the training side of things, I can't unfortunately comment um, what they're specifically doing. However, I know that the direction from uh, my leadership has been very much centralised around Vorg. And I know it will continue to be that, that way as well. So I'll be very surprised if there isn't uh, a huge topic on that as well. If you like, the, the three priorities which are all agreed with, uh, within the cluster, Vorg is, is very much that big bolt-on topic at the moment uh, for us. But as I uh, alluded to, there's, there's certainly more work and there's, there's certainly more that my team and, and, and the rest of the Met can, can do to build up that confidence as well. And I'd say society as a whole. But um, hopefully that answered some of your questions. But let me come back to you anyway on, on those other points, which I didn't quite hit. OK. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you very much. Um, that actually answers a question I was going to ask uh, as well. So that shuts me up. Um, <laughs> you'll all be pleased to hear. Um, so <laughs> uh, <laughs> and. Um, any other questions of Sergeant Bisgrove before we thank him and let him get, a, get about the rest of his evening? Well, thank you very much indeed for coming. And we all value enormously the work that the police do as a whole. But on a neighbourhood level, we enjoy excellent relations uh, with our safer neighbourhood teams through the police panels. We all go to those panels and we look forward to continuing with that relationship and sitting on those panels whether we're councillors hereafter or not. Well, thank you very much for inviting me and thank you for your time. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda is a thank formal you. item, minutes. Uh, can councillors please, through uh, a quick assent, uh, confirm that I may sign the minutes of the uh, meeting we held on the 2nd of December last year? That's a yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we now move to the next item on the agenda, which concerns the Cox Crescent Regeneration Programme. Um, what, what, what is going to happen in exactly a week's time is that the Corporate and Resources Committee will meet and decide on what the next steps in relation to that programme will be. Um, this committee is able to make comments on those proposals 
and members of the public who are here tonight for that purpose uh, may do so as well. Uh, those comments will be recorded um, by Fiona Cotter here uh, from Democratic Services and will be added to the report to that committee as late material. Uh, and so the committee will be aware of our views. Uh, as I've said, a number of members of this committee are also members of the CNR committee, two of whom are here tonight. Uh, so I would perhaps ask uh, for restraint from them because they will be able to uh, make their views known in, in a week's time uh, and indeed will be part of the committee deciding the matter. Uh, so although I won't stop them saying things if they want to, uh, I, I think we should leave the floor open to those who uh, are not going to be taking part in that committee. Um, first, however, we have a presentation. There is a report. Uh, Peter Wright has given us a report on the matter. Uh, some of you may already have seen that the, the report for the committee is also available, which is a rather fuller report. Uh, and um, some of you will have perhaps read um, the several hundred pages of exempt material which goes with it. But we won't be discussing that tonight uh, because that's not really the remit of the Neighbourhood Committee. Uh, what we're here to comment upon is the proposal so far as it particularly affects, they particularly affect the Moldens and Coombe neighbourhood. Uh, so bearing that in mind, uh, I would invite uh, Peter Wright to come forward to introduce himself and to give his presentation. Uh, after which, uh, I will invite members of the public to come forward to make comments, uh, after which I will throw the meeting open to members of the committee to make comments as well. Uh, and so, Peter, if I can ask you to take over. I think we may need to douse some of these lights to make this work. Um, and, uh, that's enough. We'll leave some on. Um, excellent. Peter, over to you. Thank you, Chair. Can anyone hear me? Yeah, great. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, my name's Peter Wright. I'm uh, uh, recently appointed as uh, Interim Director of uh, Major Developments at um, uh, Kingston. Um, Cox Crescent is one of the projects that comes under, under my remit. Um, my, my role is to, is to try and deliver the project. Um, it's been worked on to date by a number of different people. Most recently, Ian Beckett uh, was the project director, or still is the project director. Um, he's unfortunately on leave, otherwise he'd be here to, to deal with this. I will obviously attempt to answer as many, many questions as people have around the, um, uh, the projects as I can. And any that I can't answer, I'll, I'll take back and endeavour to get answered by way of the um, Corporate and Resources Committee meeting next week. Thank you. Well, I think that's. Um, don't need to read that one. Yet. So, what, what we're going to go through uh, tonight, uh, hopefully very briefly, um, is progress to date on on the project. Uh, some of the object objectives we have at the moment. Talk through some of the options for uh, the leisure centre on the site. Um, look at the housing element. Uh, talk about some of the delivery options um, in terms of the various different routes to delivery. Uh, and then the key milestones in terms of the program for the project. Next slide, please. So what we've been working on over the last few months, um, 
there's been a, a certain amount of work in respect of the um, Blagton Road uh, multi-storey car park, looking at uh, trying to get to a, uh, an agreement with the leaseholder there uh, so that that car park can be improved as part of the project. Um, obviously, currently, it's in a bit of a state. Um, and part of the, um, the plan for the project is to, is to maximise the use of that car park um, uh, to get to a more efficient land use um, uh, position across the site as a whole. Um, the other element that we've been working on is obviously the production of an outline business case, which, uh, which informs the report. Um, this is uh, standard uh, treasury methodology for business cases, and it covers a strategic, economic, commercial, economic and management cases, um, and looks at um, a, um, it developing a base case um, for the project. So the um, report and the... Uh, therefore, the Corporate and Resources Committee next week uh, asks for um, agreement the, uh, to that base case. Um, I would like to stress that that doesn't necessarily mean that the base case is what's going to be delivered. Um, there are um, questions around the scope of the project um, and a desire for certain different um, uh, elements to proceed, um, which we'll need to work through in the rest of the project. Um, we've also been looking at um, uh, land valuation, um, to try and understand the viability of the scheme, uh, the amount of money that the council needs to put in and the amount of money that it can, it can expect to get via the housing development. Um, and that has then um, produced, produced a vi viability update for the project. Um, next slide, please. So the objectives currently are um, uh, in the base case are to deliver a new um, leisure community centre of at least the same floor area as existing New Morden Leisure Centre, um, to develop uh, 339 homes, um, to provide 35% uh, of those homes for affordable housing, uh, to develop commercial space, um, deliver a receipt uh, from the sale of land and to minimise the financial impa impact on the council. Next slide, please. Uh, that's a bit difficult to see, sorry. Um, they're, they're, these are the options which are, which are in the base case. Um, they, they range from left to right. I won't go through them in detail because I'll bore you all senseless. Um, but they, they, they range from um, no change, which is just to leave the things as, as they are, uh, re refurbishing the existing pool, um, a new build pool of, of equivalent size, um, a, new, sorry, a new build centre of equivalent size, um, a new build centre of slightly larger size and then larger again. Um, those um, uh, obviously within them contain various different mixes of facilities and if there are questions that will, will require us to go into more detail I will but as I said I don't think I'll go through all of them at this point next slide please uh, the um, housing mix which is currently being considered and again this is subject to review as we get to uh, develop the business case further to get to final business case stage um, we're looking at a housing mix of, uh, of uh, 10% one bed, 60% two bed, 30% three bed. Um, the affordable um, housing options, um, obviously the, um, the base position in terms of policy for the site would be a 50% affordable housing allocation. Um, in terms of policy, sorry, um, we've looked at 35% and 20% uh, allocations. The base case that, we've, uh, that, we, we're, that we're taking forward into uh, final business case stage um, is for 35% affordable. Um, this is lower than the 50% due to uh, the requirement to produce um, uh, capital receipt. Um, that's based upon, I'm not sure why it's 60% social housing, or oh, yeah, 60% rented, 40% shared ownership, and that's based on uh, GLA requirements, and that's subject to negotiation with the GLA, um, and we're planning, obviously. Next slide, please. Um, we've looked at three different delivery options for uh, the project. Um, one was to uh, a fairly speedy route, um, which was to uh, move fairly rapidly to market the site to a developer under a developer agreement, a uh, fairly thin developer agreement, if you like, um, which would be uh, rapid, um, but then um, um, would mean that the council would lose some element of control over the project. Uh, which isn't thought to be desirable. Um, the middle option would be to um, work up further designs um, to understand uh, 
massing, density, um, the layout of the uh, final scheme um, uh, in, the, in the next stage, um, and um, then develop a design guide as part of a uh, draft development agreement and take that to market. Um, the final option was a kind of a, a more intensive option, which, which would mean the council would take the entire project up to outline planning consent um, and secure a developer. Um, that would be very expensive. Uh, it would take some time. Uh, and then um, you may get to a position where the, uh, the agreed um, uh, scheme um, um, isn't, isn't marketable. Next slide, please. So just in terms of program, we're, we're looking, obviously, we're, we're, we're now at outline business case stage. Um, we are going to work um, up the final business case over the next year, so it's not a quick process, um, and, and things are not set in stone you know, at, at this point. We need to review um, the elements of the outline business case um, and make sure that we've got proper underpinnings to the project before we, we move forward. Um, but then once we have got that signed off, we would fairly rap rapidly move into... Um, appointing a, a developer, um, they would then work with the council um, uh, to get planning, planning approval and then to actually deliver the scheme with an aimed, uh, aim to complete um, uh, the, the project um, in 2028. Next slide, please. And that's what I have. There's some, there's some supporting material in terms of plans uh, uh, behind this, which we might use if we want to refer to anything, but that's, um, that's the presentation. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I think what I will do next is if I can ask you to go back to either sit um, by Sunny or yes. sit over there on, on the right hand side where, where, where there's perhaps a little more room. Uh, and I will now invite comments uh, and, and, and questions if, if, if it felt uh, um, uh, appropriate from members of the public. Uh, and um, I, I, I think the first person who indicated a desire to ask questions was uh, Julian McCarthy. So I will ask him to come forward first. So, Julian, um, over to you. Um, and uh, I, I obviously, I, I, there's no strict time limit, but no, the, the, the amount of time uh, I allow for this is is a bit bit like how long is a piece of string. But I, I will, uh, if it goes on a little too long, call it to an end so that the committee has plenty of time to make their comments too. Okay. Good evening, Julian McCarthy, Blackton Road resident, New Malton resident. Um, which I've already said. This is regarding the Malden Centre. And just to be clear, in case it isn't clear from what you've just heard, this scheme that is being put to you uh, is based on uh, a report that has been provided by consultants and an architect. And what it will lead to is the construction of a new leisure centre <coughs> with the subsequent demolition of the existing Malden Centre and the community services that are therein. The report that you have that is being asked to be pushed through urgently next week is that because the building refurbishment will result in closure for 18 months to two years, the council and the decision being made is to build a new leisure centre alongside it such that you do not lose any services. So that is the background to what I would now like to say. I aim to be brief, but what I have to say is important, not only to the residents of New Malden, but equally to the wider community and the residents of the Royal Borough of Kingston upon Thames, Tolworth, Surbiton, Chessington, etc. I've been advised that I'm limited to questions that a council can be asked within six months. So I wish to state that here, I'm not asking for any response or any answer. I am not asking you questions. And as such, the comments I'm making, once again, are purely rhetorical. This enables me to ask specific questions at the corporate meeting next week, but it gives you, the committee, 
and the people who I believe represent New Malden the ability to hear what could be being said. It is to voice a personal and professional opinion as opposed to requiring open debate. The foundation of what I wish to say is a professional career for over 40 years as a chartered building services design engineer, consultant and expert witness. I know what I am talking about. I am employed by solicitors to give advice. Some of you may not have such expertise, but I believe that I can speak openly and know about this building. Towards the end of my career, I be it became more important from an environmental and climate change viewpoint, as well as meeting uh, clients' limited budgets, to focus on refurbishment. And I did refurbish buildings throughout the 40 years, 45 years that I've been in industry. This actually resonates well with the Council's separate policy um, published the Climate Emergency Plan, where the strap line, if you're not aware of it, is reduce, reuse, and recycle to avoid landfill. And this applies as much to existing buildings as it does to household waste, and it will do so for years to come. In addition, the fragility of the council finances demands strict control of budgets and such strict control should be implemented and regularly checked. Just so that you do not mistake what I am saying as one person's opinion and one person's view, I've spoken to fellow consultants and fellow architects in the industry, and there is a general consensus, albeit outside uh, New Malden, that what has previously been agreed and is being at risk of being implemented at the corporate and resources meeting next week is based on advice which, at the very least, should be checked and validated independently. By meaning independently, I suggest a body, such as the Council's independent external auditor, could simply be instructed to carry out a phone check to which no member of the Council or its officers has any input or contact thereby there is complete security from the potential and possibility of any swaying of the checking. You will note that the report forwarded to you at the 11th hour 59th minute makes no reference to cost. It may do so in the background, but to you or to the public, there is no reference of cost. You're simply, or the public are simply being asked to accept almost blindly a report without being able to review the financial input. I have actually been advised of the budget costs, and I'm sure that you will have these and see these to hand. The report advises you that it is on the back of decisions previously agreed in 2020. However, the world has significantly changed since then, and this makes it imperative that one takes stock of where we are now, and one asks whether or not decisions previously made are financially, logistically, and ethically correct. As a qualified professional in the specific industry pertinent to the report and speaking about refurbishment, which was option four on the table, I am offering you a free second opinion, a second professional opinion, and saying that, in my opinion, they are not. I personally believe that the advice regarding refurbishment of 18 months to 24, years, uh, 24 months closure is leading to a decision that the time is inflated in terms of the period that you would have closure. Having provided my professional opinion, I've exercised my own personal due diligence in alerting you, a public body, of my concerns. And I would expect the same due diligence is exercised individually by each and every councillor as a publicly elected individual, free from party politics, but as an individual such that, when asked, each can feel that they have demonstrated and carried out their own due diligence. In closing, I refer to the fact that a number of you, when asked why the council is making a decision based on the professional advice of one cost consultant and one architect, and have not sought second or third opinions, have advised me that the council doesn't need to. 
Surely this opens the door for poor, inaccurate, swayed advice being used as the basis of possibly meeting someone's agenda. It is not what any of you as individuals, residents of Kingston or New Malden, would do for any construction project in your house if a friend or a relative suggested, that's not right. So why are you allowing the community to be unprotected from a checking procedure that you yourself would personally implement? Isn't that double standards? In that you have the ability to carry out your own checks, but the public does not have the ability to carry out or to rely on you to carry out checks because you, the councillors, say there is no mandate to seek a second or third opinion. Clearly, some of you don't see this as double standard, but perhaps some of you do. You may say or believe that professional parties previously consulted are trusted and have their own professional integrity to advise correctly. But I can assure you professionally and personally that having worked in the industry for 48 years, a client can ask a professional consultant to steer a report in a particular agenda to meet its requirements. You may say or believe that members of the council, officers and councillors, do not try to steer things to their benefit or an agenda. But are you so certain it doesn't happen? And what if it does? You may believe, reading the report, that a building needs to be closed for two years for refurbishment. But please look up the term phased refurbishment. I can advise you that reporting of an 18 to 24 month closure is not what consultants or architects or professionals would ever suggest. You may think it's such judgment to sanction the replacement and demolition of a 35 year old building. Personally and professionally, I do not. To summarise, the fact that something has previously been agreed does not mean it cannot be reviewed and reconsidered. The world has changed. There is no urgency or need to accept this proposal next Thursday. Absolutely no need whatsoever. There is need to check the veracity of the cost and advice that you have been given and you are basing your decision on. There is need and public request for wholly independent checks to be made outside the knowledge or any potential influence of individuals who may be able to exert influence on the report. There is need for due diligence to be exercised by all. If only one of you concurs with some of the things that I've said tonight, and takes appropriate action and implements checks or holds from making any final decision next Thursday, then it would have been worth talking to you. I will be at the meeting next week and I will ask non-rhetorical questions. Perhaps you will too. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I'm sure that uh, the committee, when it hears that uh, um, again um, with other questions, will uh, take that fully into account. Um, and um, no doubt will decide whether they consider a, a second opinion on any of the independent professional opinions that they have received it is necessary. Um, now, um, other you. members of the public, um, I thought I saw two hands go up. Um, I, I know one of them very well, but sir? Uh, if you'd uh, do you mind, James, if this gentleman goes first? Would you like to come forward, please? Could, could, could you come forward so we can all hear you? If you could introduce yourself and um, let us have your comments. My name is Richard Fletcher. I'm uh, a resident of the Coombe and Malden estate. Um, my question is to do with costs. Um, we saw the presentation, but we've got no feel um, from, a, from a public point of view of the costs. And I just wondered if we have some indication of the uh, ballpark figure that we're looking at. Um, I'm, I'm afraid you, we won't, the recording won't pick up your voice like that, Peter. Um, That's it. Okay. Um, yeah, um, 
it's a bit of an awkward position, but the cost information in relation to this project is commercially sensitive because it, it forms part of the um, uh, route to market for the developer. If we, if we would say to a developer, this is how much money we're willing to put in at this stage, they would take advantage of that, of that information. That's, you know, that, that's been my advice. Thank you. Um, it, it is frustrating, I, I know, but um, this is the advice we're given that, broadly speaking, if, if, we, if we, for example, make it public what we think our land is worth, then uh, our negotiation position with a developer is, is compromised. Likewise, if we make it public what we think a contract is worth, again, our negotiating position with a contractor is compromised. Um, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, James, if you come forward. Uh, thank you very much. Um, just for the sake of the recording, my name is James Giles. I'm a resident uh, in the new New Malden Village Ward, currently Beverly Ward. Um, I've got a few points, and I shall make further comment at the Corporate Resources Committee next Thursday. Um, my first e can be found uh, referencing the next steps. I'm just trying to find exactly where in the report that is. Paragraph 27. Uh, the next steps following approval will be two, and amongst the things listed there says uh, pro progress discussion with high street property owners and explore, if required, the need for compulsory purchase orders. Now, some of you on this committee may well have been on the Finance and Partnerships Committee in 2019. In that report, 20, oh, I beg your pardon, um, time, doesn't time fly? Um, in, in that report... Uh, well, it does for some of us. <laughs> in that report, there was a diagram uh, which showed a number of properties uh, on the high street that would need to be uh, purchased and demolished to create a through route, uh, one of them being uh, New Malden Post Office and Sorting Office, number 150 High Street. Um, and at the time, Councillor Green, um, who sat on that committee, said that there would be a meeting established um, to try and work out whether or not that site was to be included. Um, it was vague from the diagram, although myself and others uh, who looked at it, including post office employees at the time, uh, agreed that that site did appear to be within the scope of the diagram. So my first question is, can, uh, if not this committee, Corporate Resources, rule out the purchase and demolition of 150 High Street? I know there was talk at the time that it could be perhaps reprovisioned within the new development, but let me tell you that's not how Royal Mail Group work. Um, my second point uh, is to re-emphasise the last speaker with regard to cost. Um, it seems very peculiar, um, given you want to, to involve the community, that you present various options for what the community want the pool to be, um, but can't actually provide, if not a cost, uh, a comparison of... Uh, for instance, the number of flats that would need to be built as, as a rough guide based upon the options. Um, you can see on the diagram there a uh, number of homes again being built on the Blagden Road open space. And so a commitment that uh, there will be no net loss of green space uh, would certainly be uh, welcomed. It certainly looks from that diagram like there would be a loss of green space, which of course is different from open space if you include the concrete square. Um, which will be on the site of the former Causeway and Crescent Centre. Uh, and my final comment would only be to say that uh, if, as so often happens with this local authority, a developer really pushes the authority back and, uh, you know, insists that, you know, it's just not feasible, construction costs going up, etc. And so option one would need to be considered to, to rebuild a, a new centre that actually has no benefit rather than providing an extra 15 gym stations. It would be the same size and otherwise have exactly the same facilities. Uh, it just seems a lunacy to me that that would be considered at great cost, not only financially, but also environmentally, um, when we've got a building that surveyors say is structurally sound that we could refurbish. Excellent points, James. Um, I, I, I'm four square behind you on your last point, if I may say so. Um, Please hear it. Uh, <laughs> Peter, um, 
Sorry, I, I'm, I didn't catch your witticism there, Councillor Hughes. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I don't know whether, Peter, you want to answer any of those points now. They'll probably come up a, a, in a week's time anyway. Um, uh, so it, it, we've made a note of your points, James. Um, I, I, I think in relation to the post office, um, perhaps, Peter, you can clarify that now. Um, I, 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 mean, I would say that the post office itself, office itself was never part of this scheme. The post office itself was never part of this scheme. The sorting officer's office at the rear was, but I believe it's unlikely, in, although not absolutely impossible, that it will be hereafter. taking the, uh, the post office or the, or the sorting office as, as part of Peter, I don't, don't think your mic's on. That's just working. There we go. So it's on now? Ah, OK. So, yeah, sorry. The, uh, the current base case is, is, is predicated on us not taking the, uh, the, 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 uh, the sorting office, so that, um, that isn't part of the potential CPO. That's very reassuring to hear. Thank you. I'll just make one final point, if I may, uh, Simon. Um, and, and that's just, just a point which, again, I will reiterate on Thursday, um, that, of course, whilst the Council may wish to, uh, as it says on, on the board, seize the moment, um, I, I would merely remind the authority that this decision is subject to call-in, and we will be going into a purda period, which may delay matters somewhat. Thank you. I, I do think you mean pre-election period. I mean purda. Yeah. Um, Peter, um, but what, what, there was one before we moved to, well, I'm, I am part of the committee, and so um, the, the question about open space uh, and no, no, no net loss of open space, are you able to clarify what that means in relation to the Blagden <coughs> Road open space? Yes. Um, that, that, that means that... Um, uh, any space taken in terms of the park will be replaced by equivalent space. So it's not swapping green space for, for concrete. Well, that's pretty much as clear as it can be. Um, thank you very much. Uh, now we move on to the next stage of this discussion, which will be comments and questions from uh, the committee. Um, uh, again, um, if you could just raise your hands for... Any comments or questions that you have, uh, your comments will be recorded uh, and answers to questions will be recorded and passed on to the committee that is to make this decision. So, uh, are there any? Uh, Councillor Bailey, thank you. Hi, here. Yeah, uh, um could you clarify uh, perhaps what's going to happen to the adult education element of this? It's, it seems a little bit vague here, I mean, two of the options, we still have a, um, a, a pottery studio and lots of the meeting rooms where our lessons take place, and I don't know if the flexible community space is a particularly valid substitute for that, so do we know where the adult educate, I know there's some very small working groups talking about that, but will there be any commitment to ad adult education in any of these options? Or, okay. um, I Peter, can you answer that? I, I think Councillor Cobbett may be able to help us that, on that as well. I don't know. But do, do go ahead, Peter. Sorry, is that it? Sorry, that's me. Do I have to? About now. There we go. Um, um, so uh, in terms of making commitments, I don't think we can make a commitment at this stage. Um, but what I would em emphasise, and in response to some of the other questions that have come up, is that there is a, a further design and review process um, to go through in this project in all aspects um, to get it from outline business case to final business case. And we will be um, looking to include all of the representatives of all of the groups that use uh, the, the centre currently as part of that process um, to define this, the solution for the project. Thank you. Um, any other questions or comments uh, from members of the committee? I do, do um, I don't know if I should reserve it till next week. Um, I, I, I think you should, <laughs> yeah, broadly, okay, um, <laughs> un unless there's something which uh, directly arises out of what has just been said. I can wait till next week. 
Thank you, Councillor Durrant. Um, no? Well, I think that probably draws this to a close. Um, it, 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 it's an odd sort of way of proceeding, but uh, it does enable members of the public and members of the committee to make comments which will be recorded and go forward to the decision-making committee and, and keep us all abreast of what is happening. So thank you very much, Peter, and, and um, thank you for coming along and giving us that presentation. Thank you, um, The eagle-eyed amongst you Maybe will, will have noticed and, um, uh, that I missed out the Neighbourhood Manager's Report. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So sorry about that, Meg. Over to you. That's all right. Thank you, Chair. Um, can everyone hear me? Is that on? Yeah, it is on. Um, thank you. Um, so it's quite a brief uh, update this evening. Um, I'd like to talk about the State of the Borough Debate event. This year's event will take place online at 7pm on Tuesday the 22nd of March and the theme is COVID Impact and Recovery. This will include discussions with a panel of experts on how the borough came together in response to the pandemic and how the community and economy are recovering. As part of the Council's commitment to community engagement and working together with you, we'd like to invite residents to sign up for the event and submit your questions on COVID impact and recovery to our panel. This can be done through the RBK website. Next, I want to talk to you a bit about the Platinum Jubilee street parties. Um, if you are thinking of holding any celebratory street parties, the deadline to apply for an application to do this is the 30th of April. For more information, Again, please visit the website. And finally, I'd just like to remind residents to um, sign up to register to vote. If you've moved house since you've last voted, you must register at your new address. Everyone in your home must register individually. And to register, you can do this on the government website, uh, www.gov.uk forward slash register to vote. Thank you, Chair. Thank, thank, thank you very much. Um, and the next item on the agenda uh, in, is, again, your item, uh, which is neighbourhood grants. Um, we have a, a, a few uh, to go through this evening. Uh, so if you can um, deal with those in the order in which they appear yep. on the agenda, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, so our <coughs> first application is Zoological Society of London. The committee are being asked to consider a request from the Zoological Society of London to allocate £3,000 of neighbourhood community grant funding for the Kingston Hogwatch project for New Malden. Um, we have here Elliot Newton, our biodiversity officer, who is going to talk about that project in a bit more detail. Thank you very much. Great to see you, Elliot. Great to see you too, Chair. Thank you. And thank you. Evening, councillors. Um, yeah, so uh, as you can probably see, uh, I'm actually, uh, uh, I'm not DSL, I'm the Biodiversity Officer for the Council, but I'm here representing them uh, because unfortunately I had to pass their apologies this evening. They could have attended virtually, but I don't think that was an option for, um, uh, they couldn't get here physically, unfortunately. Um, but yes, I'm here to make the request uh, for £3,000 to the uh, Neighbourhood Grant for um, the Kingston Hogwatch project. Um, this uh, is... Uh, going into the second year of the project. So last year we uh, uh, worked in a collaborative fashion, the Kingston Council and as I said, worked in a collaborative fashion to uh, survey uh, Surbiton neighbourhood's hedgehog population. And it was a fantastic uh, initiative. We had 60 wildlife cameras that were deployed uh, across the neighbourhood, focused on the Hogsmill Valley, um, looking for our hedgehog species. And hedgehogs, as I'm sure probably are aware, um, are actually one of our fastest declining mammals. In my lifetime, we've lost about two thirds of our hedgehog population, and that's in about 30 years. Um, so it really is a pretty dire situation. But the positive news is that hedgehogs um, have, um, there's a lot of research coming out that they're sort of refuges, their sort of population is stabilizing in our suburban environment. So we have a real opportunity here to try and save um, um, our local hedgehog population. Um, so the proposal uh, this evening is that we try and um, replicate the comprehensive uh, ecological surveying and community engagement work that was conducted last year in the Surbiton neighbourhood, uh, in, in the Old Morden and Coombe neighbourhood, to uh, deploy 60 wildlife cameras in our green spaces and in, our private, in people's private gardens. Um, 
so uh, really interestingly, last year, even though it was uh, the, the funding was technically restricted to service and neighbourhood, we managed to get a few cameras out on the back of the school here, actually, <laughs> on Southwood Nature Reserve. And uh, we actually picked up some pictures of cameras, uh, pictures of hedgehogs just, just here. So we did actually get a hedgehog record. We're talking about 50 metres from where we're currently sitting. So we know there are some hedgehogs here. And uh, what we need to do is try and understand that population slightly better. Um, and all the, all the information that we uh, collate will go into uh, supporting and informing the Kingston Council's Biodiversity Action Plan and specific, specifically the Hedgehog, um, hedgehog uh, Species Action Plan. Um, the budget has been uh, detailed in uh, Section 8 of this report, um, but yeah, hopefully that gives you an indication to what we're asking for this evening. Um, thank you very much. And indeed, it is set out in, in excellent detail in the report. Um, does the committee want to ask Elliot any questions or have any comments about this? Councillor Durrant. Um, it uh, was more a, a comment, really, and uh, I, I, I have to say I trailed this on the New Morden neighbourhood and it uh, proved to be very, very popular uh, in the community as well. Um, and, and a suggestion, if I may, I think uh, uh, we have later uh, friends of uh, the Beeline Way and also um, the local allotments, so I think it might be a good idea uh, to perhaps, um, if everybody got together and perhaps we could uh, put some cameras uh, along the Beeline Way and in the allotments, because uh, I think that, that would be a good place to spot some hedgehogs. Thank you. <coughs> um, yep. Um, the Beeline Way has been, I think, a great success. I think everybody would uh, agree with that. and. Uh, I, I hope it's not only a, a, a great uh, asset for people to go down, but also a great home for wildlife. Uh, Councillor Wookie. Yes, I live around the back of Manor Park, and I've only seen one hedgehog, um, and they can't get into my garden um, because there's a huge fence, um, barbed wire and everything. Um, foxes can get over it, but uh, hedgehogs can't. Are you going to be doing any education on how people can help hedgehogs? Um, absolutely. So that is a key part of this, this project. It's very much community focused to raise awareness of um, uh, the hedgehog population and what people can do as individuals to improve our environment for hedgehogs. So as part of this project, we will be uh, encouraging people to become hedgehog champions. So we have voices for hedgehogs within the neighbourhood that will can just uh, and, and make people aware of the very simple actions, for example, putting a 13 centimetre hole in your fence to, to enable a hedgehog to sort of move through, because a hedgehog can actually go about a mile just in one night, so it's very important that it can be able to move through the landscape. Um, there will also, as part of this programme, there will be two um, educational talks all about hedgehogs that will be open to anybody, uh, that will be done virtually, and we did those uh, last year, and we had um, 96... Um, people attend one of them, so uh, or, or, or apply, uh, to attend one of them. So there's real interest in it, and hopefully it can be a real opportunity to secure the hedgehogs' <laughs> viability in terms of their population in, into the future. Excellent. Well, um, I'm sure we all, um, well, I hope we all, think this is a great idea. Uh, so do do I sense a unanimity of uh, assent to this grant? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for that presentation, Elliot, and. Um, carry on the good work. Thank you. Um, next one. Thank you, Chair. Um, the next uh, application is from um, New Malden Rotary Club. Unfortunately, can't be here tonight. Um, but they are applying for £3,000 of neighbourhood community grant funding for the hanging basket on the New Malden High Street. Um, it's quite a straightforward application. The £3,000 will contribute to the creation of the hanging basket putting the hanging baskets up and the maintenance of the hanging basket from May to October um, this year. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> and we move swiftly on to the first Malden uh, Scouts. That, that's, um, that's Tadworth, isn't it? In Tadworth Avenue in the home zone just behind uh, the Fountain Roundabout. Uh, who are applying for £2,982 uh, for some cycle uh, stands. Thank you. Hi there, my name is James Havelock. I'm the chair of the Scouts. Um, so, yes, we're asking for 
So we have around 88 young people that were there, but the hut which um, we're looking to put the cycle rack to also um, hosts several local businesses during the week. And we would just like to encourage them. We have the beavers on their scooters right through to the scouts and explorers who would be cycling in. Uh, the parking isn't great there. The idea that we can get more people exercised up and you know, driving the, uh, uh, cycling there, we think it'd be a great initiative. Uh, we've kept the cost down by uh, looking to make sure that we actually just use our volunteers to create the concrete slab, to install it, and then just make sure that the space is on top is um, using the proposal that we've put forward. Um, but really, we're just looking, we've got the land and the space to be able to put the cycle rack there, and we think it would be a great long-term investment. Sounds great to me. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you very much for coming along. You're and right. and um, I um, wish you every success in, in getting people on their bikes. Thank you. Um, awesome sitting here, just because I've just heard it mentioned. You might want to consider, uh, we have a ring camera at the back. I back onto the um, beeline, and we have seen a, a hedgehog come across. So you might be able to draw upon people who've just got security cameras and happy to share it. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. And um, the next item is uh, Meg. We are. Thank you. Yeah, the next item is from the New Modern Resident Association and Friends of Beeline Way. Um, and we have Natalie Walton here to discuss her project. Is this. Yes, it is. Um, so I'm just asking for some funding for the brick arch bridge that run, goes over Beeline Way. There's been an increase of tagging on that recently and then the council covered the tagging in lovely brown paint um, and so I wanted to protect the bridge from further graffiti. I think the brick works really nice so just keep that with a plain anti-graffiti coating, a clear sorry, and then where the brown paint is add some sort of artwork I've spoken to a graffiti artist and he can do a badger on one side and butterflies on the other. So. We have built hedgehog houses down uh, Beeline Way as well with the help of Elliot. I, I, I sense a community of uh, assent to this. And again, thank you. Uh, unless there's thank any you. questions no. arising. We, 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 we are very pleased to be able to support that. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you to Councillor Heap for her donation as well to top up what was available at the moment. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next one up, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, our next grant application is an ENTEL application, um, and it's the Elm Road allotments. They're applying for £6,000 of... Um, neighbourhood community infrastructure levy for their coal project. And we have Lynn Edwards here to discuss. Um, we've got 107 plots, 148 I think in total now, plots on the site. And we have a corral which has got wood chip and manure because we discourage fertilizers and use natural products as much as possible. The problem we've got is that it has got a soft surface, so the lorries sink inside it. And I promise you, if you've tried to dig a boat or a lorry out, it's not a lot of fun. Um, this causes more difficulties because the manure and everything gets delivered onto the front, which means the people we've got on mobility scooters and various other things can't get by. And it also means that the... Um, plot population, the people who've got lotments, if there's no manure and wood chip, they're, bring, they're using petrol and all the other stuff to go and get products and we don't know what those products are whereas we do know the products that we've got um, we've costed it and to create the hard surface and soft surfaces and drainage um, and replace some fencing is for the 6,000 we are aware that construction costs are increasing as we sit here tonight. They've probably gone up. Um, but we have got 
a bit of budget so that if it went over the 6,000 because of concrete and other materials, we can cover the any um, what would normally be an overspend. That's it. Any comments or questions? Um, sounds uh, an excellent project to me. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Yep. Is the hedgehog gentleman gone? <laughs> I, I think he wants a hedgehog. Don't yeah. <laughs> He's just gone. <laughs> it, 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 is, it is really... Yeah. Um, you, you can get in touch with Elliot very well. Yeah. Elliot Newton, that's his name. Yeah. And, and he always responds. He's great. Right. Because we haven't, we haven't seen any hedgehogs on Elm Road. Um, but we've got lots of other things. and a lot, We've got lots of ponds. Just mm -hmm. to let everybody know, we encourage ponds. Not massive ones, so we drown children because they can be, <laughs> they can be just as dangerous. But we do encourage them. But I haven't seen any hedgehogs. Okay. So well, we'll sorry, we'll, we'd like we'll, them. We'll keep um, our eyes peeled. That, yeah. Yep. <laughs> as, as a matter of priority. Right. So Excellent. That, that's well, it. That's it. Um, we um, unanimously again approve the grant. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. I will not coming. dig any more lorries out, I hope, for a while. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Cheers. Thank you very much. And I, I think um, that was Ensel, but I, um, the, uh, the grant programme is now finished, isn't it, Meg? We have spent, well, not spent, but allocated the whole of the £20,000. Uh, yes, that's correct, Jeff. Yeah. That's good news. Um, now, the next item on the agenda is uh, a disabled bay on Gooding Close. And, Sonny, I think you're going to present that. Thank you, Joe. Um, first of all, thank, um, apology from uh, the two user officer that couldn't be here tonight to present the report. Uh, they both send their apologies to the committee and instead they send me instead to do the presentation for them. Uh, this is good thing close disabled by uh, it's, it's, a, it's a, an objection to a traffic order for us to install the disabled by in good thing close. If you look at the, um, the, the plan on Annex uh, 1, the officer has um, assess the application and it meets all the criteria for a disabled bay and is, um, is, is, um, it needs it and it qualifies for a gentleman or, or a person living in good and close. Um, officer basically asking the committee to, um, to set aside the objection and, and allow the disabled bay to go ahead to be implemented. I mean, if you look at the uh, item four and five, there are two objections that we receive. Um, there are already two objections. One, there's already two disabled bay in good and close, and which hasn't been used very uh, oftenly, and that, that's the concern. And installing this new disabled bay in good and close will take away more parking spaces for residents in the area. Officer has looked at the two objections. Basically, Officer Common is um, the two disabled bays is related to Fountain Court, which is in a private area of the state. It's, it's not a public highway. So the council have very little or limited power enforcement or regarding their use or, 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 or what to do with them. Um, so basically, officer asking the committee to approve the disabled way and set aside the two objections for tonight. Uh, if any question or any comment, I, I would take it away or try to answer them as much as I can. Um, thank you very much. I, I saw James, you raise your raise your hand. Um, I know you're, you you live pretty close. Uh, um, I'm I'm pretty familiar with Gooding Close as well as I know is both Councillor 
Heap and Councillor Durrant. So do come forward, James. Uh, thank you, Chair. When, when I read this report, um, uh, I was somewhat confused. Um, the officer says that the two existing bays, which if you see the annex uh, on, on the map, they're, they're highlighted as existing disabled bays, are on private land and therefore can't be enforced or managed by RBK. But as I'm sure at least some of you on this committee are aware, Fountain Court is of course wholly owned by RBK. It's sheltered housing for elderly people. And so I was somewhat confused when it says it wasn't managed or enforced by the council, because of course it is. Um, obviously I'm not against more, more disabled bays being given, but I think that the points made by the objectors are certainly valid. And, and I would merely question what the officer has written, that they have no power over the two existing disabled bays. Because actually if the council doesn't enforce on their own land, then who the bloody hell does? Uh, yes, I, I noticed that as well, James. And I think what I would say is that um, we, the, it's on private land, so people who live on Gooding Close itself can't use them. Mm. Um, uh, you have to be a resident of Fountain Court mm. to be able to use it. You there aren't, there, there, no, uh, yes and no. If you enter the main fountain court vehicular entrance, mm -hmm. there are bays within that courtyard that clearly are signposted for residents only. Mm -hmm. But those particular two bays, which you access almost as if they were drop curbs onto, onto a drive, there isn't actually a sign currently there, and maybe that's a separate failing, that says residents parking only. If you drove into fountain court, yes, I'd wholeheartedly mm -hmm. agree with you. But actually those two disabled bays, I know from people who live in Good and Close, are regularly used by those people who don't live on Fountain Court. And, and I come back to my point that, although it's not public highways land, it is RBK land, and therefore it is NSL that would be responsible for enforcing if a non-Blue Badge user was parking there. That, that, it, it just confused me, that's all. I, it, uh, I, I agree mm. with what you say about their location. They are straight off good and close, yes. yes. Um, I don't think it would be NSL who enforced them because NSL has no jurisdiction outside highways. It would have to be um, whichever agency we use to enforce parking on council land. Um, yes. I, 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 I can't yes. say exactly. NSL that. have enforced them in the past, I would add. I'm um, aware of that. Ha having, having said all that, what I think the point is that the uh, if you live on good and close, you don't actually have a right to use that. Mm. Uh, and therefore... Um, whoever whoever it is, and I don't know who it is, who wants to be able to park on good, good and close, uh, because there are plenty of properties on good and close which don't have uh, drives. Yeah. Some do, some don't. Mm. Yes. Uh, Sonny, do you do you have anything further you want to add to our, that on that point? Um, like you said, uh, the, uh, the 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 council cannot enforce. Um, Maybe it's RBK land, but maybe it's a housing land. It's not an adopted highway land. So um, I, from the note that I had um, in front of me from, from um, the, the, the neighborhood um, engineer, Ian Price, he said, that's it, categorically, that's it, a private um, disabled way for the people in Fountain Close. Uh, that's all I can say, yeah. Yeah, um, but I agree with you. It's, it's not clear cut, I, I would agree. No. I don't think we're, we, we will necessarily agree that if, if it's a disabled bay, whether it's private, RBK, whatever, if it says blue badge holder, regardless of whether you live there or not, if you hold a blue badge, you are entitled to park there. But I will leave my comments there. Yeah, mm. thank Fair you. enough. I, I'm, the comments well made. Yeah. Um, Councillors Durrant or Heap, do you have anything further to say on that issue? Yeah, just one comment. Um, I agree totally with uh, Mr. Giles, who just said it is a bit unclear. My question to Son Sonny is... Does anybody use these spaces? Are they purely for people who have visitors? And are there many disabled drivers actually at Fountain Court with cars? That was just a general question. It's raised the issue that the two existing disabled way is rarely used. Um, uh, but we haven't done any monitoring or counting that 
they are fully used or not. Well, because they are in a private land, not an adopted public highway. So we we have no due restriction to and find out who should be able to use them or who register them for and stuff like that. Uh, so we ha I haven't got any information on them. I suppose the point is that the person who's applying for this can't, can't legally use those. That's it. Mm. That's, that's what. Anyway, um, there it is. It's, it's not perhaps the most straightforward of these that we come across, but um, they do arise every now and again. Um, and do we need to take a vote on this or uh, um, are we happy to say we agree that the objection should be set aside? I'm happy to have a, a show of hands if you like. What, what does the committee feel? Shall we have a show of hands? <coughs> or do we not need one? It, it agreed? Are we agreed that it should be set aside? You want to, well, in that we'll case, if, if someone wants to abstain, we'll have a show of hands. Yeah, so it won't take a moment. All those in favour of uh, setting aside the objection so that the uh, disabled bay effectively goes ahead, please raise your hand. Uh, anyone against? And abstentions? We have three. Thank you very much. Um, so that the objection is set aside on that basis. Um, thank you. And I think, Sonny, you're up again for the next item on the agenda, uh, which is the planned highways maintenance program, um, which, again, is a consultation item only. Um, it's a rather unusual one because the matter has already been to the Strategic Committee. But, um, Sonny, you can explain how it comes to us. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Jeff. This is the, uh, the highways uh, plan maintenance program for 2022 and 23, which is this year and next year, financial year. Um, this report is for the neighbourhood, con to consult the neighbourhood uh, and to ask for any comments, anything that we can... It's a bit unusual one. Uh, the, the actual decision making to implement this plan maintenance program for next year has already been approved at uh, the strategic committee, which happened last week on the 10th of um, March, as a committee called PLACE. Um, so I've been asked to bring this to the committee, basically, to consult the com committee that on, if you look on Annex 1, we have, officers have identified about 10, 11 roads in Modern and Coombe. Uh, that's required carriageway resurfacing. And one footway scheme that currently ongoing in Nightwood Crescent will be continue on into next year. Uh, I mean, if the committee have no common or no um, changes or any, then we will carry on, apply our um, budget and reserve as them 11 road um, in Modern and Coombe there for, for next year. Uh, but if any member or committee feel any changes or any common, then I can take it away and we can reassess and um, and we will look at it again. Yes, I think, um, I believe it to be the case that the committee resolved to delegate to... Uh, the assistant, is it Matthew Hill, the assistant? The assistant director. Matthew Hill, the assistant director, uh, the power to make changes to this uh, should anything arise out of tonight by way of comment which uh, uh, would lead to any such changes. So. Um, although it's slightly unusual for us to be making comments after the strategy committee has uh, considered it, uh, the door has been left ajar so that any comments that we may make uh, can be taken into account and acted upon if necessary. But I agree, it is, it is a bit odd. Um, but anyway, 
Does anybody have any comments? Oh, um, we have a comment from the member of the public. Well, almost a member of the public. Also, um, I understand a, a possible candidate for election to the council. Well, perhaps, but uh, we won't go into that this evening, eh? Um, uh, those of you who, who are on uh, place committee will know, and I, I say this every year, and I probably sound like a broken record, but the footway in Highbury Close is in desperate need of resurfacing. Uh, a resident down there who is uh, partially sighted had a fall due to the uneven paving there, and uh, the council's municipal insurance paid out a rather handsome sum to the resident, of course, um, for her injuries. I've been making this case since 2016, and I say this every year when this item comes up. In 2017, the road was resurfaced. It hadn't been done since the road was initially constructed 68 years prior. It had been forgotten, apparently, by highways, and so the road was done. However, the footpath still hasn't been done. Residents down there, especially elderly residents, don't like using the footpath. They walk on the road. Uh, and that lady uh, in particular no longer leaves her house unless she's driving uh, for fear of uh, another fall. And so I made this point at place committee, but I'll make it again here this evening, that if officers could please, if they can't do the whole footpath, look particularly at the uneven slabs and not just the one slab that they replaced uh, because of uh, the resident's injury, uh, then I would be grateful. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure the officers will take that away. Um, um, and um, get the street inspectors to uh, inspect it and, at, at the very least, uh, make sure that any current dangers are dealt with forthwith. Thank you very much. Any, any comments from the committee or questions? Councillor Cobbett. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, we're in a situation where there isn't the, the budget for as much improvements as we would, would have been pre-COVID or as we might like. But I suppose one thing, it may not be answerable now, but one thing I think it would be good to see in future such reports is where we have had, and we have had a number of times over the cycle, people bringing in petitions about particular footways or particular roads of concern to them. It would be useful to, even if they don't all end up being finally prioritised for funding because it's a competitive process and all the rest of it, it would be useful to at least, if we could get some tracking of, of, the, of, the, scheme, of the potential schemes that have been brought up by, by petitioners and public questions and just get some commentary on you know, where they considered or if they didn't make it, why they didn't make it. I realise you won't be able to do that off the top of your head tonight, but it would be useful to see at some, at some stage. Thanks. Thank you. Um, we'll, I don't know if you've got anything to say currently about that, but you'll take it away in, in any of can I, can I say, yeah, I mean, thank you, Chair. I mean, we, we do make note and add, keep a list of uh, throughout the years where member of publics or councillor or petition raised to us which role that they want us to look at and do them and we do respond to every single one of them. Uh, we tell them that why is not make it to the list, because there's certain criteria that we have to go through. Uh, for example, if two roads or two footways is exactly the same condition, they both bad, and one is in a highly used high street or near a church or near a school, that one will take priority over a dead end close or, or, or a cul-de-sac. Just that is the nature of the limited budget that we have. So we have to prioritize, depend on the, the number, the usage, the traffics. Um, uh, that, that, that's a standard that we apply in the council. Uh, but like I said, every road in the borough by law we must have what we call a safety inspection at least once per year. That's why we have highway inspectors to walk around the street and pick up any ad hoc defects and safety inspection, and we do spend a lot of money raise and repair them. Not that we ignore them, you know. If they're bad, report them to us, and we will send an inspector straight away to have a look at it. Quite, quite so, and of course there is a, an ability to report dangerous defects in the road or uh, on the footpaths on, on, on the website. On, online, yeah. yeah. 
Um, anything else? Um, those comments will all be recorded and duly passed on to Mr. Hill. I think that's that. Um, so we move on to the next item on the agenda, which is the Cooma State Highway Maintenance Estimate, which I, I again think, Sonny, you're dealing with tonight. Well, <laughs> I, I know from previous experience that um, this is a, a matter which is dealt with behind the scenes very much in the lead up to this meeting. And I, I believe also that uh, the estimates are agreed. Uh, so if you could add anything to that, um, please do, um, as you're here to represent the Residents Association. Yes. Um Richard Fletcher, I'm the treasurer of the um, Malden and Coombe Residents Association. Um, the budget has been discussed and agreed uh, with uh, Tracy Kirkpatrick. Um, Tracy actually had a, a, a few changes. We had a, um, a few increases. Um, the budget you see here tonight, the total of 125,730 has been approved by the Residents Association Committee. So. Um, if everyone's happy to um, authorise it, um, we are very happy to monitor it over the next year, and we trust it won't come to 125,000. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, um, I don't know if anybody's got any questions or comments. Otherwise, I think we can unanimously approve this. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. You. And uh, we move then to the... We move then to the next item on the agenda, uh, which is the consultation in relation to neighbourhood boundary arrangements. Um, uh, yeah. um, <coughs> as you, um, most of you, if not all of you will know, the um, Boundary Commission uh, uh, changed the wards um, and um, that will come into effect shortly after well, on the 5th of May, I suppose, when, when the elections take place. And, and that requires um, the, uh, some thought to be given on, on the shape of the, the four neighbourhoods. Well, it wouldn't have to be four, but uh, there are currently four. And uh, this uh, matter comes to us, as, again, as a con consultation, consultation item. Um, and so uh, if we have our head of democratic services here, Gary Marson, to uh, explain, uh, give a short explanation of, of the report, which we've all read, uh, and then uh, it will be thrown open again to comments and questions, both from the floor and um, from the committee. So Gary, o o over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so as you, you quite nicely set the scene, this is, this is a report which is um, setting out proposed changes in the neighbourhood boundaries. Um, this is consequent upon the changes in the Council's warding arrangements, which members will be aware of, and which come into effect from the, the borough elections on the 5th of May. Um, so it's obviously therefore necessary also, since the, the ward boundaries tend to, tend to align with the neighbourhood boundaries, to, to review the neighbourhood boundaries as well. The, um, the draft proposals um, have been circulated to all of the neighbourhood committees. In fact, I'm just hot foot from Surbiton, where they've just been, been considering the proposals tonight there as well. Um, and um, the intention is that the recommendations and the comments from these neighbourhood committees will be reported to the Corporate and Resources Committee, which meets next week. Um, and then that will make a recommendation to Council on the 26th of April. Um, which will determine the final boundaries. So in terms specifically of this committee, um, the proposal, um, and it is at the moment, as I say, I emphasise, just a draft proposal, um, is that it, it would comprise, going, the neighbourhood would comprise going forward the, the new wards of Coombe Vale, New Malden Village, Green Lane and St James, Motspur Park and Old Malden East and Old Malden. Um, the, the significant change that, that you'll obviously have noticed from there is that Coombe Hill 
is proposed to move to a Kingston facing ward. We recognise that, that that may be something of a fine judgment. Um, clearly parts of the Coombe Hill ward will face towards Kingston and part probably more naturally towards New Malden. So I'm really interested in the committee's views on that and, and on any other aspect of the proposals, including the name of the neighbourhood. We'd be interested to obtain members' views on, on the preferred name too. Uh, thank you. Um, James, uh, do come forward and let us, let us know your views. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, I have a few comments. Um, and the first, I think, actually links back to, to the previous item. If we look back at the history of both New Malden and Coombe, the two civil parishes were actually merged together to form the Maldens and Coombe Urban District, which in 1936, of course, uh, had a charter of incorporation, became the municipal borough of Malden and Coombe. The historic uh, borough has its own coat of arms, which covers Maldens, New Malden, Old Malden, and, of course, the entirety of Coombe. Uh, and let's not forget it was the predecessor council that purchased the Coombe lands, uh, Coombe Hill Golf Club and Coombe Wood Golf Club. And it was only in 1965 that that area, which is more or less currently comprised of the Maldens and Coombe neighbourhood, was brought into the wider uh, Royal London Borough of Kingston-upon-Thames uh, in 1965. And so on heritage grounds, I think it would be remiss to remove Coombe Hill from the Maldens and Coombe neighbourhood and put it into a Kingston neighbourhood from which it's had nothing to do with until 1965 when, when, when the merger happened. Um, trying perhaps to second-guess sort of some of the fine judgments, um, I can appreciate, of course, uh, that under some uh, proposals with the wider boundary commission, looking at parliamentary boundaries, of course, that um, uh, Coombe Vale, uh, I believe, moves into to a Kingston and uh, Surbiton constituency, and obviously Coombe Hill remains in a, a Richmond Park and North Kingston. So I, I can appreciate the perhaps the rationale behind that, if, if that were it, but I would emphasise, of course, that the current proposals from the Boundary Commission are a draft, and indeed there is a counter-proposal um, that would have Old Malden and St James back in Kingston and Surbiton, uh, and Coombe Hill and Coombe Vale into Wimbledon, and I was up at Westminster making that case. Um, but on heritage grounds, uh, I would be very much against Coombe Hill moving out of the neighbourhood uh, into Kingston. Um, we've got a lot in common uh, at Maldens and Coombe, that's why the two parishes were, were brought together um, and you know, it's, it would be a shame to lose it. Thank you. Um, nicely put. Um, any other members of the public um, wish to comment? Um, comments and questions from... Uh, well, more comments and questions, because um, what's proposed is pretty obvious. Um, Councillor Hughes. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, it, it's, it, it's just a comment and I think a thorough endorsement of what Mr Giles has just said. I think it's important to take into account uh, the historical context of neighbourhoods and how you know, this historic rural borough has been brought together. And yeah, I'd, I would support exactly what he's just said. Thank you. Um, any other comments? Uh, Councillor Cobbett. Thanks, Chair. I don't know, because it's a bit like with the other paper where I'm on the Corporate Resources Committee where it's going next week, in fact, even more so because I'm presenting it. So I don't know whether you, you want me to respond to comments tonight or whether you, I could just, you would prefer if I wrap them up into my introduction of the item next week. I, I think, I think um, wait, wait for next week, please. Yeah. Councillor yeah, Happy to wait till next week, or indeed whenever, when anyone is uh, struggling with insomnia, I can come round and give you a, an, an off-the-cuff rendition yeah. as well. <laughs> because I'm sure, I'm sure these, these points will be made next week in any event um, in the discussion then. Uh, Councillor Wookie. It's, it's a question, actually. How long have we had neighbourhood committees? Sorry, I didn't catch I didn't that. didn't catch that either. How long... Oh, sorry. How long have we actually had neighbourhood committees? Uh, I think um, Gary uh, may be the best person to answer that. 
I, I wish I could answer that, Chair, actually. It certainly goes back to the late 1990s. I'm aware of that. At one point, I believe we had as many as seven. Um, but, but I'm afraid I, I couldn't tell you when they were first introduced. But they've certainly more than 20 years. Um, I, mean, I, I, I found this one uh, tricky, actually. Um, I must admit, uh, as um, Gary, you said, it, it's a fine one. You, it seems that Coombe Hill, you, you've got the bit around the hospital to the east and west and, and surrounding the hospital, which is very much Kingston. You've got the bit to the north of the golf course and um, the, the, the Malden golf course, that is, because there's, I think there's about three golf courses within the ward itself, um, which is more connected to New Malden. Then you've got, the, you, you've got all the way down to Rob, Robin Hood Gate, which is neither, frankly. Um, and and I, 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 I am, I, I do feel the historical point that Councillor Hughes and James, you make. Um, but um, the, the neighbourhoods are, as Gary, you pointed out, a, a recent construction, uh, recent comparatively anyway. And uh, their, their whole point is, is to bring decision-making uh, nearer the residents. And so here we are sitting in Richard Challoner uh, and the, the people in parts of Coombe Hill uh, will, I think, a lot of them would be quite surprised to, to think that they have anything to do with us down here. Um, and I, I, I have found it difficult, my, my own feeling so far as it's helpful to the committee uh, next week is that the recommendation in, in this report, the suggestion in this report is the right one. Uh, but it is a it, it is a fine balance, and I, 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 I'd be the first to accept that. As regards the name, I, I think the one that's in the paper just about gets it. Myself. James has got his hand up. Uh, any, anybody else on the committee wants to say anything else? Yeah, I saw your hand go up, James. Don't vision. worry. Anybody else on the committee? Because you, you you've already had your go. Very good. You're, 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 you're a fount of knowledge. <laughs> so is the phone. So is Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. So, if there are no other comments, we'll, we'll record all of those, pass them on to the committee upon which Councillor Cobbett sits and who's been listening, I'm sure, very, very carefully. He, he nods. Um, and um, bring that item to a close. Um, that actually brings this meeting to a close because there are, as, as ever, going to be no urgent items authorised by this chair. Uh, <laughs> and I make that 9.34 and a bit, which isn't bad. Um, but before we close, I'd like to thank everybody um, who, who's come tonight thank all my colleagues. I, I've done this now for nigh on four years. There, there may or may not be a further meeting of the uh, planning subcommittee of, of, of this committee, but this is the last meeting before the elections of the um, Modern Coombe Neighbourhood Committee. And so I'd like to thank everybody who supported me in my role as chair over these last four years. I'd like to thank the officers in particular who've helped me, uh, Meg uh, and those who preceded her. Um, I, I would have liked to thank Sam personally tonight, but unfortunately he's not here. He, he's been my left or right hand man uh, over the last four years and has done a terrific job. Um, so um, some of us may be back uh, uh, in, uh, uh, after the election. Uh, some of us uh, may, are definitely not going to be back. Um, uh, to, to, to everybody, um, you've, I, I can say without fear of contradiction that you've all served your communities uh, excellently. And, and um, I think the spirit in which business has been conducted at this committee has been of the highest order of cooperation. Uh, and, 
So um, that's it, really. I'm um, good luck to all of those who are standing. That includes you, James. Um, and um, it may see you or may not see you hereafter in, in this room. Who knows? Anyway, good night. Thank you, Chair.